Okay, guys, good morning. This is March, uh, no, March, April 21st. It's a Tuesday. And um, let's see, I have revised almost all of your writing exercises about the positive things during the quarantine. Now, my instructions were clear. You had to do a Word file. You had to type a Word file. Why? Because then when I receive it, I can place revision and I can't correct. And then I can send you. Almost everybody, okay, the 90% of class did it, but still some of you sent, you did a handwriting, hicieron a mano, y me tomaron foto. Y eh, al tomar foto, o sea, yo no puedo corregir en un, en un uh, escrito así. Por favor, siga. Let me admit, Sofía. Uh, let me because she's also an interested part in this. All of you are listening to me. Raise your thumbs, please. If you're listening, okay, good. So, Sofia, you're in. Okay. Para los que me enviaron el deber, hecho a mano, tomado una foto, y a veces me mandan la foto así, y ni siquiera el, el formato no me da, tendría que tomarle una foto, pasarle a... A, a Word, editarle para que ponerle, si no sean crueles guaguas, lo único que les pedí es hacer un escrito en Word, ok en Word y mandarme como un adjuntarme con un archivo punto .doc, como un archivo de Word no hecho a mano entonces eh, quienes lo hicieron eh, yo les he enviado un correo diciendo que lo tienen que copiar de lo que hicieron a mano, lo tienen que pasar a un archivo Word y así lo recibo. A los que lo hicieron en Word, por favor, revisen su, um, to all of you that did, did follow the instructions, that did follow the instructions, that, okay, Sebastián, good morning, let me get him in. To those who did follow the instructions of doing the Word, um, file, I have sent you by mail to your mails. And if you didn't have a mail to your pa your mom's mail, okay, I have sent you the a PDF of the word with my corrections and any observation, okay? Eh, Sebastián, si tú hiciste el ejercicio a mano, <coughs> en lugar de hacer como fueron las instrucciones, escribir, tipear en un, en un documento Word y subirme como documento Word para que ustedes puedan ver las correcciones que yo hago. Si me mandan a mano y una fotografía, no puedo corregir. No puedo corregirles. Me tocaría, a ver, pónganse ustedes de mi parte, sean empáticos. Pónganse de mi lado, ¿ok? Ustedes mandan una instrucción y los tres primeros que abres son fotografías de un documento hecho a mano. Cuando la instrucción hagan por Word y les di la explicación de por qué. Entonces, pónganse en mi lugar. Es mucho más eh, práctico que yo pueda corregir, hacer la revisión, que me tengo la opción en Word, hacer las correcciones, enviarles para que ustedes vean dónde ah, hubieron errores. No he visto, um, okay, up to here in Spanish. Uh, so those that did the handwriting exercise, you have to type it in a word and send it in a word format in Educai Tareas, okay? That's the way I'm receiving it. Otherwise, I am not, okay? Very good. And most of you, 99% of the things I've read, okay, um, are nice. And I, I am really happy that you're enjoying this time with your family and that you're cooking. Uh, some of you have been baking, but um, so try to bake the cake I gave you, the, the, the yogurt cake. It's very easy. It's very good, I promise, okay? So you can try that. Um, uh, some of you, are, well, what most of you like is getting up late. Good. Okay. 
and uh, being able to, you are becoming more organized with uh, your work, that's what you said, um, that you're spending more time with, uh, with your pets and at home and helping, you have learned how to cook. Well, that's very nice. So not everything is bad from this quarantine. There are a lot of nice things that we have to learn from this event, uh, which is hard pretty hard but we are uh coping it with it the best way we can okay very good so um check your mails you have the ones that haven't turned in your homework yet i'll wait till today i only have two of you that haven't turned in your homework yet so please uh today today i need it okay very good so let's see so we are almost finishing. We're going to finish our chapter uh, today and we are going to do a listening exercise. We're going to listen to the audiobook so that you're going to lis uh, listen to a quite different version from the one we have here with a little bit more of detail. And you're going to listen another accent. You're going to listen to somebody else. Okay, uh, somebody has their... Sophia, I'm going to mute you because otherwise I have noise. Very good. So here, uh, we ended here. Okay, very good. Now we know why Mr. Craven, that's an important uh, event that I had, that I have to add to your, uh, your PowerPoint presentation, is that now we know why Mr. Craven does locked the garden and why he doesn't like it. Who can tell me what, why? Who can tell me why? Why? What's the reason? What happened inside the garden? Because his wife died. Okay, so she was in the branch of a tree. It broke and she died, right? And from what we know, she was pregnant of Colin. So that's why he was born uh, almost immediately after that, okay? So there are two things that show how Mary is changing in the relation with uh the need of human relationship. One, two expressions I pointed out yesterday. Two expressions I pointed out yesterday. One is on page 14, and the other one on page 17. So go to page 14. Around here, remember, I pointed out here something. Remember what Mary thinks? That people look nicer when they smile. See that people look nicer when they smile. And on page 17, I pointed out this, that when she, when Martha tells her about what happened in the secret garden, she feels sorry for somebody for the very first time. She had never been sorry for anybody. Okay. So those, those two ideas shows us that Mary is changing and accepting and um, understanding how important human relationship is, which is one of the themes of that novel, right? So uh, that's important. And the other thing is that she, the other event that's going on, she's listening to this crying. And Martha is always telling that it's the wind, but she knows it isn't, okay? So let's continue. Let's go. I'm going to read it right now. So we finished chapter two today. We are going to do the listening on, um, on Thursday. We will revise some probable questions. And on Thursday, I will send after the class uh, before noon, I will send the questionnaire you have to answer. And that will also be a grade. Okay, very good. Uh, so the next day, we are on page 18 up here. So we see Miss, who is this, girl, uh, this lady? Who is this lady? Who can tell me who this lady is? Mrs. Medlock. Mrs. Medlock. And she doesn't look very nice, right? She's, she has a strong face, just to say. Okay, so we left off when uh, there's the cry and Martha says, uh, no, she replied, I don't think. It must be the wind. But at that moment, that's in page 17. But at that moment, the wind blew open their door and uh, they heard the crying very clearly. I told you, cried Mary. At once, Martha shut the door. It was the wind, she, she repeated, but she did not speak in her usual natural way. 
and Mary did not believe her. So the next day, it was very rainy, so Mary did not go out. Instead, she decided to wander around the house, looking into some of the hundred rooms that Mrs. Medlock had told her about. She spent all morning going in and out of dark, silent rooms, which were full of heavy furniture and old pictures. She saw no servants at all and was on her way back to her room for lunch when she heard a cry. It's a bit like the cry I heard last night, she thought. Just then the housekeeper, Mrs. Medlock, appeared with her keys in her hand. What are you doing here? She asked crossly. I didn't know which way to go and I heard someone crying, answered Mary. You didn't hear anything. Go back to your room and if you don't stay there, I'll lock you in. Mary hated Mrs. Medlock for this. There was someone crying. I know there was, she said to herself, but I'll discover who it is soon. She, almost, she was almost beginning to enjoy herself in Yorkshire. Okay, so that's up to chapter two. Um, any question on it? Are we clear of the characters, of the main events that have happened during this uh, unit, this chapter? Are we clear? What time is it? I have to check time, 9.20, and that's uh, to 10, right? Okay. Are we clear on it? Thumbs up? Thumbs yes. up? Yes? Okay, Ana, Sofia, Maria Emilia, Francesca, Joel, Ariela. Are we on it? Okay, so we understand the characters. What are their um, importance? What are what is the role they're playing in the in the novel? Okay, so right now I want to share the reading. I'm gonna share computer sound, and hopefully I will find it. Uh, hopefully, hopefully no, I have to go. Uh, just wait a little while, please do not think I am going away. I'm just going to open this up here. Okay, here, now I think I can share it. Let me go back to you. Okay. Um, don't worry, I'll be back, I'll be back. Are you looking here? Are you looking at the screen? No. Okay, there, are you looking to the screen? Yes. Okay, yes. so uh, let's listen to this audiobook. So today you're going to have a listening exercise. If you listen to any word you don't understand, let me know. We are going to uh, go through chapter one and two as far as we can, okay? Very good. In low, strange voices, Mary knew the fair young man who looked like a boy. She are had heard listening? that he was a very young officer who had just come from England. Yes. Okay. Child stared at him, but she stared most at her mother. She always did this when she had a chance to see her, because the Mem Saib, Mary used to call her that oftener than anything else, was such a tall, slim, pretty person, and wore such lovely clothes. Her hair was like curly silk, and she had a delicate little nose which seemed to be disdaining things, and she had large, laughing eyes. All her clothes were thin and floating, and Mary said they were full of lace. They looked fuller of lace than ever this morning, but her eyes were not laughing at all. They were large and scared, and lifted imploringly to the fair boy officer's face. Is it so very bad? Oh, is it? Mary heard her say. Awfully, the young man answered in a trembling voice. Awfully, Mrs. Lennox. You ought to have gone to the hills two weeks ago. The Mem Saeed wrung her hands. Oh, I know I ought, she cried. I only stayed to go to that silly dinner party. What a fool I was. At that very moment, such a loud sound of wailing broke out from the servants' quarters that she clutched the young man's arm, and Mary stood shivering from head to foot. The wailing grew wilder and wilder. What is it? What is it? Mrs. Lennox gasped. Someone has died, answered the boy officer. You did not say it had broken out among your servants. I did not know, the Mem Saeed cried. Come with me, come with me. And she turned and ran into the house. After that, appalling things happened, and the mysteriousness of the morning was explained to Mary. 
The cholera had broken out in its most fatal form, and people were dying like flies. The ayah had been taken ill in the night, and it was because she had just died that the servants had wailed in the huts. Before the next day, three other servants were dead, and others had run away in terror. There was panic on every side, and dying people in all the bungalows. During the confusion and bewilderment of the second day, Mary hid herself in the nursery and was forgotten by everyone. Nobody thought of her, nobody wanted her, and strange things happened of which she knew nothing. Mary alternately cried and slept through the hours. She only knew that people were ill, and that she heard mysterious and frightening sounds. Once she crept into the dining room and found it empty, though a partly finished meal was on the table, and chairs and plates looked as if they had been hastily pushed back when the diners rose suddenly for some reason. The child ate some fruit and biscuits, and being thirsty, she drank a glass of wine which stood nearly filled. It was sweet, and she did not know how strong it was. Very soon it made her intensely drowsy, and she went back to her nursery and shut herself in again, frightened by cries she heard in the huts and by the hurrying sound of feet. The wine made her so sleepy that she could scarcely keep her eyes open, and she lay down on her bed and knew nothing more for a long time. Many things happened during the hours in which she slept so heavily, but she was not disturbed by the wails and the sound of things being carried in and out of the bungalow. When she awakened, she lay and stared at the wall. The house was perfectly still. She had never known it to be so silent before. She heard neither voices nor footsteps, and wondered if everybody had got well of the cholera and all the trouble was over. She wondered also who would take care of her now her ayah was dead. There would be a new ayah, and perhaps she would know some new stories. Mary had been rather tired of the old ones. She did not cry because her nurse had died. She was not an affectionate child, and had never cared much for anyone. The noise and hurrying about and wailing over the cholera had frightened her, and she had been angry because no one seemed to remember that she was alive. Everyone was too panic-stricken to think of a little girl no one was fond of. When people had the cholera, it seemed that they remembered nothing but themselves. But if everyone had got well again, surely someone would remember and come to look for her. But no one came. And as she lay waiting, the house seemed to grow more and more silent. She heard something rustling on the matting, and when she looked down, she saw a little snake gliding along and watching her with eyes like jewels. She was not frightened, because he was a harmless little thing who would not hurt her, and he seemed in a hurry to get out of the room. He slipped under the door as she watched him. How queer and quiet it is, she said. It sounds as if there were no one in the bungalow but me and the snake. Almost the next minute she heard footsteps in the compound, and then on the veranda. They were men's footsteps, and the men entered the bungalow and talked in low voices. No one went to meet them or speak to them, and they seemed to open doors and look into rooms. What desolation, she heard one say. That pretty, pretty woman. I suppose the child, too. I heard there was a child, though no one ever saw her. Mary was standing in the middle of the nursery when they opened the door a few minutes later. She looked an ugly, cross little thing and was frowning because she was beginning to be hungry and feel disgracefully neglected. The first man who came in was a large officer she had once seen talking to her father. He looked tired and troubled, but when he saw her he was so startled that he almost jumped back. Barney, he cried out, there is a child here, a child alone, in a place like this. Mercy on us, who is she? I am Mary Lennox, the little girl said, drawing herself up stiffly. She thought the man was very rude to call her father's bungalow a place like this. I fell asleep when everyone had the cholera, and I have only just wakened up. Why does nobody come? It is the child no one ever saw, exclaimed the man, turning to his companions. She has actually been forgotten. Why was I forgotten? Mary said, stamping her foot. Why does nobody come? The young man, whose name was Barney, looked at her very sadly. Mary even thought she saw him wink his eyes as if to wink tears away. Poor little kid, he said. There's nobody left to come. It was in that strange and sudden way that Mary found out that she had neither father nor mother left, that they had died and been carried away in the night, and that the few native servants who had not died also had left the house as quickly as they could get out of it, none of them even remembering that there was a Missy Sahib. That was why the place was so quiet. It was true that there was no one in the bungalow but herself and the little rustling snake. End of chapter one. Okay, so we are going to start chapter two, right? Um, I have some other. I have some chapter other two words. of the Secret Garden. I will let this you LibriVox know. recording is in the public domain. Recording by Karen Savage. The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. Chapter two. 
Mistress Mary quite contrary. Mary had liked to look at her mother from a distance, and she had thought her very pretty, but as she knew very little of her, she could scarcely have been expected to love her or to miss her very much when she was gone. She did not miss her at all, in fact, and as she was a self-absorbed child, she gave her entire thought to herself, as she had always done. If she had been older, she would no doubt have been very anxious at being left alone in the world, but she was very young, and as she had always been taken care of, she supposed she always would be. What she thought was that she would like to know if she was going to nice people who would be polite to her and give her her own way as her ayah and the other native servants had done. She knew that she was not going to stay at the English clergyman's house where she was taken at first. She did not want to stay. The English clergyman was poor, and he had five children nearly all the same age, and they wore shabby clothes and were always quarreling and snatching toys from each other. Mary hated their untidy bungalow, and was so disagreeable to them that after the first day or two nobody would play with her. By the second day, they had given her a nickname which made her furious. It was Basil who thought of it first. Basil was a little boy with impudent blue eyes and a turned-up nose, and Mary hated him. She was playing by herself under a tree, just as she had been playing the day the cholera broke out. She was making heaps of earth and paths for a garden, and Basil came and stood near to watch her. Presently he got rather interested and suddenly made a suggestion. "'Why don't you put a heap of stones there and pretend it is a rockery?' he said. "'There in the middle.' And he leaned over her to point. "'Go away!' cried Mary. "'I don't want boys. Go away!' For a moment Basil looked angry, and then he began to tease. He was always teasing his sisters. He danced round and round her and made faces and sang and laughed. Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and marigolds all in a row. He sang it until the other children heard and laughed too, and the crosser Mary got, the more they sang, Mistress Mary, quite contrary, and after that, as long as she stayed with them, they called her Mistress Mary, quite contrary, when they spoke of her to each other, and often when they spoke to her. You're going to be sent home, Basil said to her, at the end of the week, and we're glad of it. I'm glad of it too, answered Mary. Where is home? She doesn't know where home is, said Basil with seven-year-old scorn. It's England, of course. Our grandmama lives there, and our sister Mabel was sent to her last year. You're not going to your grandmama. You have none. You are going to your uncle. His name is Mr. Archibald Craven. I don't know anything about him, snapped Mary. I know you don't, Basil answered. You don't know anything. Girls never do. I heard father and mother talking about him. He lives in a great, big, desolate old house in the country, and no one goes near him. He's so cross he won't let them, and they wouldn't come if he would let them. He's a hunchback, and he's horrid. I don't believe you, said Mary, and she turned her back and stuck her fingers in her ears because she would not listen any more. But she thought over it a great deal afterward, and when Mrs. Crawford told her that night that she was going to sail away to England in a few days and go to her uncle, Mr. Archibald Craven, who lived at Misselthwaite Manor, she looked so stony and stubbornly uninterested that they did not know what to think about her. They tried to be kind to her, but she only turned her face away when Mrs. Crawford attempted to kiss her, and held herself stiffly when Mr. Crawford patted her shoulder. "'She is such a plain child,' Mrs. Crawford said pityingly afterward. And her mother was such a pretty creature. She had a very pretty manner, too, and Mary has the most unattractive ways I ever saw in a child. The children call her... Okay, I'm going to stop there, okay? Did you listen? Yes. Yes. What happened with your listening from the beginning to as the, as the listening went on? What happened with your hearing? At the beginning... Was it more difficult to understand? Answers, please. Was it more difficult to understand at the beginning and then kind like your hearing became more used to the other accent and it becomes a little bit easier? I want you to write down these words that I want you to add to your vocabulary, please. So I'm going to share the whiteboard. I'm going to type them in and I want you to um write them down please okay so the first one is disdain the next one is affectionate the next one is light frown neglect okay neglect 
stamp, stamp, but uh, you're going to look at it, uh, not as a stamp como estampilla, but stamp a foot. What does to stamp a foot mean? Okay, quarrel, snatch, snatch, a heap, tease, snap, and horrid. Okay. Um, are you are you writing down? Yes. Okay, so I want to, you to add these words to your vocabulary and they will also be included in your, um, in your, in your questionnaire for this week, okay? Disdain, affectionate, glide, frown, neglect, stump, like a stump a foot. Like when you go up and you're mad, cuando se ponen bravísimos y boom, el pie en el piso, that's to stamp a foot. Quarrel, snatch, heap, tease, tease, snap, and horrid. Okay? If you want, you can go back. You have the, um, you have the link of, the, of this audiobook. I sent it to you on the other parcial, one of the first things I sent you. And you can listen to it again, and maybe you can find where these words were said, and you can deduct the meaning, okay? Everybody finished writing down? Yes. yes. All of yes. you, who didn't yes. finish? Who didn't finish yet? Okay, I'm, I'm just in case I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna print screen this so that I can, okay, stop sharing, very good. So guys, um, this is as far as we're going today. On Thursday, continue, continue listening to the audiobook on listening, uh, on, sorry, on Thursday, we will finish listening chapter two. Please bring questions if you don't understand something. You will be revising your PowerPoint, you can um, revise your, 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 uh, um, book, you can read it again. Important for, for this chapter to know the characters, the new characters that have uh, been included now, Martha, Ben, Mrs. Medlock, the Robin, and the mention of Dickon. He's not yet in the novel, okay? He has only been mentioned. And um, the main events that have happened during this, uh, this uh, chapter, that I want you to know so that you can answer the questionnaire properly on Thursday, okay? So, um, have you, hope you have a great uh, day uh, with the um, invitation for, to, for Thursday class. I will send the words, also the words that I sent you right now. For the ones, para los que me hicieron el trabajo a mano, Lo tienen que repetir en Word y mandarme subirlo pa en el, el desde Tareas y Ducay. A las dos personas que todavía no me han enviado, último día que recibo hoy, favor hacerlo y enviarme también por Tareas y Ducay. Por favor. Ok, eh, para los que no, no lo hicieron en Word, hoy día tienen que enviarlo por Word. Ok. Um, eh, so, sí. Profe, sí. Yo ya le envié. Sofía, ok, very good. Ok, eh, ¿quién? Eh, a ver que no haya registrado ahorita. Alvarado Sofía, sí está. Astudillo, sí está. Castro entró un poco atrasada. Casco, sí está. Emilio, no está. Eh, Ceballos, bueno, ella se, se integra con el B. Eh, María Emilia, sí está. Gianluca está, Jaramillo Emma no está, ¿verdad? Eh, Esto dos ya no. Eh, Kevin, si sí entraste un poco atrasado y Adriana Toledo está. Ok, very good. So, I'll see you on Thursday. Read, revise, uh, so that you can do great in the questionnaire this week, ok?
So see you on Tuesday, on Thursday. Have a great day and have a, a great rest of the week also. Okay, see you on Thursday. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Victor. Bye. 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 Bye.